Hi everybody. Uh, you're hopping on to this video because you were interested in under what conditions can a rational function actually cross its oblique asymptote. So, again, this is above the level of our course and you are not responsible for knowing this, but if your curiosity was kind of peaked a little bit and we were interested in knowing why, then this is the video for you. What we're going to do is we're going to quickly kind of walk through that same graph that you saw in your lesson. I just want to make sure that we understand what I'm talking about when we say that we cross the asymptote and then to have a discussion as to under what conditions that can happen and why. So all I'm going to do is just kind of affect that picture that we had first addressed. So I want you to imagine that in this instance then, that gold curve didn't go through and approach that asymptote but not touch it. But instead, maybe we had something like this, where it actually went through and crossed and then approached from below. Something like that. So for us to first have an idea, that means that it has to hit your asymptote at a certain position. That's what we're talking when we say crossing your asymptote. Okay, let's talk a little theory as to why. So I just want to come back to that screen that you viewed where we talked a little bit about the theory of how we find an oblique asymptote. And really what I want us to focus in on is just this section in the middle where we're going to go through and we talk about rewriting out our function. Now, it's never required, as I said, to ever write that out, but it's just for us to kind of break down the components a little bit. So I want to zoom in on that portion of our function or of that portion of our work. Okay, so what you see on the screen then is our f of x equals q of x plus r over h of x. And there is us identifying that our linear asymptote is the answer we got when we divided. It is our q of x. The r over h of x describes the difference between our curve and our asymptote. So I just want to write this down on the screen then to make sure, not because you need to remember it or it's a note to take, but it's just so we can reference back to it again. That if my curve crosses the asymptote, Right? So it's going to cross that asymptote. Then there must be at least one point where we cross, where they're equal. So then it must equal the asymptote at that point. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. And that's what we drew on that opening picture. If my curve crosses the asymptote, then they must be equal. And you guys know that is like solving a system. You find the point of intersection. So that is where they are equal. Okay. If that's the case, then, if Q of X is my asymptote, as we see above, in green, and F of X is the curve, we see that in blue, then we know that f of x, and this is in purple, must equal q of x. So I just want to stop there for a second, make sure that we are on the same page. If my curve crosses my asymptote, then they have to be equal. And if the q of x is my asymptote and the f of x is my curve, then f of x has to equal q of x if our curve crosses the asymptote. So what that means then is way back in that original expression, if we can look up at the top in the blue, if f of x is going to equal q of x, then that means that this r over h of x has to have a value of zero. It can't exist. So that's what allows us to draw the conclusion that r over h of x 
must equal zero if f of x is to equal q of x. Okay, if we're good with that theory, then what I want to do is I want to spend some time breaking down that last statement. If we acknowledge that r over h of x has to equal zero for my curve to intersect my asymptote, then we need to break down under what conditions does that have to happen and how can that happen. That's where we want to go to next. So let's start out with what I would argue would be like your most common case or maybe the easiest one to see. That for us to get r over h of x to equal 0, well, the easiest way for me to get a fraction to equal 0 means my top equals 0. So therefore, I could draw the conclusion that r must equal 0. And that would be 100% true. Now, I want to examine, okay, well, what would that mean if r equaled 0? Well, that means that if I took my original p of x and I divided it by my divisor, d of x, then that means that I would get my quotient, my answer, with no remainder. Now, we should be pumping the brakes pretty hard on that. That means that when I divided out my d of x, it went into that exactly. There was no remainder. And if I have no remainder, then that means that d of x is a factor of p of x. Now, that's got to bring back some stuff that says, but wait a second. If my d was my factor or was a factor in p of x, then that means it would have divided out evenly. So let me put up a very quick example to illustrate that. We did that back on the vertical asymptote day. What if I had a function and I divide it by a linear expression? Now I go through, you would be able to factor the top. And when we divide out that common factor, we get exactly an expression. There is no remainder. Well, we know in this instance, we wouldn't have an oblique asymptote then. That what we end up getting is a gap at x equals negative 3. That actually, if we were to go through and sketch or graph that function, that function would be a line. A line at y equals x minus 4, not an asymptote at y equals x minus 4. So, if we take a look back, it's not quite as simple as my remainder must equal zero. If my remainder must equal zero, and in fact is zero, then I don't get an oblique asymptote at all. So, I have to kind of amend my thinking a little bit. It's not that my remainder, or it's not that I don't have a remainder, it's that my remainder does exist and could equal zero, but doesn't always equal zero. Now, before we start to think of that and go like, well, what does that mean? It means that my remainder could have many different values, one of which could be zero. So just before we think that this is so complicated, it's not really. Let me give you this example as my remainder. Imagine that my remainder to something was x minus 1. I'm dividing, let's say, by x squared plus 2. Can we see that that green fraction can equal 0 for an x value of 1? but wouldn't equal 0 for an x value of 2, or 3, or 4, or negative 5, or negative a million. And so. so it's possible for my final expression, my remainder divided by my divisor, 
to equal zero in one instance, but not in others. Okay, if we're good with the green, then what we want to do is we want to nail down the conditions. Okay, so I want to jump back to that final expression, my remainder divided by h of x. It has to equal zero. Again, it has to equal zero to cross the asymptote. So most of our divisions have had something along the lines of a linear divisor. Let's just call that ax minus b. We'll make it as generic as possible. If I'm dividing by something linear, then we know that if we get a remainder, that remainder has to be a constant. And I'll just put in my number symbol for my constant. I hope that we can see that right now, that blue fraction can never equal zero if I have a remainder. That is, the only way that that blue fraction could ever equal zero is if my constant on top equals zero. And if my constant on top equals zero, then I don't really have a remainder. And so I'm hoping that what we can see then is the condition necessary for my curve to cross my oblique asymptote. I need to have in the form, my gold form, some expression on top that has a variable to it. There has to be a variable in there that's going to allow the top to change values. So I'm going to go back to that green expression that I wrote, x minus 1. Well, what if my remainder was x minus 1? It's possible for me to have a remainder of x minus 1. However, if my denominator was still linear, I hope that we can see we actually didn't fully divide. That again, if we come back and revisit some old theory, my remainder has to always be at least one degree less than my divisor. And so in this instance, then, my denominator can't be ax minus b. It can't be linear. If my top's linear, then maybe my bottom is quadratic. Maybe my bottom is cubic. And who cares how ugly that cubic is? Who cares? But I do know that the denominator in that fraction has to be a larger degree than the top. So right off, on the, or right off the bat, then, what we can examine is one of the key conditions for this to happen. What it means, and I'm just going to write it down so we can see it explicitly, is that my top has to have x's. It must. It must be an expression that can change. It can't be a constant. And if my top has to have x's, then my bottom, oops, must, and it's a must, be a higher degree than the top. So I'm hoping theory-wise that, that we're okay with that to get to that point. And I think the only thing that might be missing a little bit is let's just go through a quick numerical example so we can see it very practically, like we can see some specifics in there just to kind of nail down the theory we've just discussed. Yeah, okay, so what you see on the screen is a ton of writing. <clears throat> I don't really want us to get lost in the writing, but what we have at the very top is just us going through and there is our function. Now, we take a look at that function and we could see the top is one degree more than the bottom so unless that top has a factor of x squared plus 4x minus 1, then we see we're going to have an oblique asymptote. Okay, so I just did the long division, and we work our way all the way down to that green remainder of 6x plus 2. We see our answer, x minus 2, so we know then that y equals is our uh, 
X minus two is our oblique asymptote. And in my last line, all I've done is I've written that out in that form. Notice my white is my original expression, my purple is my asymptote, and at the end, there's my remainder divided by my divisor. So what I want to get at then is this is an example where my curve would cross my oblique asymptote because it is possible for that remainder to equal zero. It doesn't always equal zero. Like I have an expression, 6x plus 2 over x squared plus 4x minus 1. That it's going to equal many different values as x changes values. However, if I was just to examine the top, and I'm going to come up here, I can make that fraction equal to zero by making the top equal to zero. And notice it is possible to solve that top. Your 6x equals negative 2. And so x equals negative 1 third. Notice then that at an x value of negative 1 third, my remainder would equal 0. And therefore, my curve does equal my asymptote. It would actually cross there. So I am hoping that that numerical example just gives a little more context as to how it happens. We, we talked about why, but maybe now we can see in detail how that kind of comes about. For the most part, though, I'm hoping that we can see that this would be a more unusual thing for us to occur in our course, especially because most of our divisors in our rational functions aren't quadratic. They're linear. And so we know then that if I was only devising, uh, dividing by something like ax minus b, then my remainder can't have x's. It's got to be a constant on top. And therefore, I don't have to worry about crossing an oblique asymptote. Okay, hopefully you found this, this video helpful. Um, if you were kind of having that itch to want to know why or how or when that could occur. Okay, best of luck with your practice.